Section 10, Finale, Chapter 64, Frogs Being Boiled to Death in a Pot. Here's an analogy that my neighbor laid on me many years ago. He's a scientist, and although he never actually did this experiment, he says it's true. You have two pots of water on a water and the other has water that is sitting above a low flame, so it's lukewarm at best. The next step involves a frog, which is a cold-blooded animal. What happens if you drop the frog into the pot of boiling water? The frog becomes immersed, then immediately jumps out, scalded and scarred, but still alive. Now, if you drop a frog into the second kettle, which is just like a little lukewarm, the frog will adjust to the temperature and stay there. Is The experimenter with his frog settled in the pot can slowly turn up the heat by small increments, ever so slightly increasing the temperature, but not by noticeable amounts until the water begins to boil and the frog eventually dies. My neighbor said it. The frogs will stay in this environment until they eventually burn to death. Isn't this an going on in our lives in regard to the government? We are the frogs being boiled to death by those in control. Isn't it clear to everybody? Those in power rarely do things in a dramatic fashion or with wide sweeping drastic strokes. All they do is keep turning up the heat ever so slightly. Look at taxes, our loss of static impositions, etc. I hate to say it, but we are the frogs. Chapter 65 David Rockefeller speaks. Breaking news Late last night, President George Bush admitted to The Economist magazine that not only did he and other members of his cabinet know about the 9-11 terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center in New York City, but that they also allowed them to happen so that American oil companies could further maximize their profits in the Middle East and Caspian region of Turkmenistan. Paul Wolfowitz, Secretary of Defense, confirmed this startling revelation to the Washington by saying that the airplanes in question were never actually hijacked, but were flown via remote control into each skyscraper in the Pentagon while military jets were ordered to stand down until this atrocity took place. In another part of the world, Kofi Annan, Secretary General of the United Nations, held a press conference in Harar, Zimbabwe, where he confessed that the AIDS virus did not happen rather created by the World Health Organization in unison with rogue elements of the United States military in order to deliberately kill tens of millions of innocent people or useless eaters as they are called behind closed doors. And Anne further elaborated by saying that this genocidal program will continue indefinitely until enough of the herd has been thinned. While this startling CBS Evening News anchor Dan Rather broke into regularly scheduled primetime programming to announce that the very foundation of American society, our right to a democratic vote, has been declared null and void and that the American people have been bamboozled for the past 20 years via vote scam. In other words, Rather said matter-of-factly, Every president in recent memory has been selected beforehand by a group of hidden controllers, while the process of voting at the ballot boxes has been nothing but a ruse. While all of these events took place, Alan Greenspan, chairman of the Federal Reserve, sat before Congress under the glare of television cameras and laid it all on the line. He said in no other is a privately owned for-profit corporation and that his international banker bosses laugh until their stomachs hurt over the tax system they've created to pad their already overflowing pockets. Greenspan even went so far as to quote, a Rothschild family member as saying, 
the people of America and indeed the world are dumb coughs, idiots. They slave away at our companies and make us rich. Then before we throw them a few scraps via their paychecks, we take our money first. Hell, we don't even take it. We steal it anywhere from one quarter to one third right off the bat. They don't even see it. And every year, taxes and take even more and what do they do about it nothing they don't even fight congressmen laughed uproariously as they left this session and hopped into their limousines which took them to fancy steak and lobster houses george Tenet, cia director got into the act by telling syndicated radio talk show host mike gallagher his agency its black budget drug trafficking practices while the FBI at the same time bolsters its war on drugs. In other words, he said that while the CIA keeps bringing drugs into the country, the Justice Department will keep throwing the users into jail. He even said that President Bush might bring back Nancy Reagan's Just Say No program for good measure. As this news flashed across computer screens the world over, David Rockefeller sat in a plush European boardroom with members of the Rothschild, Morgan, Warburg, and Bromfman families. And even though the above mentioned revelations were highly damaging to the roots they had perpetuated for decades, none seemed worried. Mr. Rockefeller began with an air of superiority. Why should we be concerned everyone on the internet is going to do? What, one of his shadowy cohorts replied. They're going to tap out their keyboards, then rifle it off into cyberspace. Then someone else will read it, post it on a message board, and continue tapping away. Hell, we rammed two jets into the World Trade Center, and now they know the truth about what we've done. They know the truth. It's the same as when we blew up the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City and made Timothy McVeigh our fall guy. But what are they going to do? Send more messages on their silly computers? It's a riot. Plus, we've also admitted that we actually steal their money via taxation, that we created the AIDS virus to kill them off, that their votes don't matter and that we're going to start shipping their sons and daughters off to another Vietnam War in Iraq to die so that we can make more profits for our energy and drug cartels. No more doubt about it. And what do they do? Sit in padded chairs in front of their computer screens and type out messages to each other. It's like, hey, George, guess what? The government really did know about the World Trade Center attacks, and they let it happen anyway. Now I'm going to see if I can find any information about the UFOs at Area 51. Doesn't it trouble you, though, that there are so many people on the Internet finding out the truth, another man blurted? Why should it, Rockefeller smiled. None of them are doing anything about it. Well, they can, can read 50 articles a day. What do we care as long as none of them do anything about it? Half my ass off at all of them as they tap, tap, tap away. I think we pushed this whole internet idea on them anyway to keep them secured, physically isolated from each other. It's hard to revolt against us when they're all sitting in front of a monitor. But David, a senior official interrupted, what if they start getting or and mr rockefeller sighed we have a problem we control some of the most well-known alternative news sites on the internet they're nothing but front groups that give the appearance of but plants there's so much information on those sites though another man objected that's true rockefeller said riley but information is useless unless it's followed by action. I don't give a damn if they know every secret in creation. A lot of them already do. But as long as they don't do anything, let them keep passing their little articles back and forth. I agree, a stern-faced woman chimed in. 
But there's recently been talk about an independent internet news and action group called WING, World Independent News Group, that's bringing all of these news services and websites together en masse so they can actually challenge the mainstream media that we control. In all reality, Rockefeller responded, this is currently the biggest challenge to our authority that exists in the world today. And if you want to know the truth, it would be so easy for them to do is get a growing movement of regular everyday citizens to see through our smokescreen. And in no time, the illusion would be over. Once Americans and people of the world in general have lost utter faith in the credibility of our mass conditioned media, we've lost the game. At the time being, most everyone questions the media, but they still tune into CNN and read Time magazine. What a bunch of dupes. But if a viable alternative presents itself that is above and beyond the lies that we tell, in other words, if they tell the truth and expose us on this wing site, it's all over. And here's the clincher. The other night, we listened to a telephone conversation between Victor Thorne and a well-known reporter, and she said that she couldn't believe that any of the alternative sites wouldn't want to be a part of this movement. And guess what? The everyday people who read Thorne's ideas are adamantly in agreement with him. But it's a few of the crucial alternative websites that aren't lending their support by informing their readers. And do you know why? They'll keep churning out articles and posting them on their sites, but when it comes to taking action, all of a sudden these sites are strangely silent. Why? Because they work for us. The techniques we use with these alternative sites are the same ones we use in the mainstream media. We marginalize, we refuse to act, we alter and distort, and we refuse to run material or cover stories by certain people. I mean, why don't more of these cyberspace people see through our ploys? It's so clear and the tactics we use are older than dirt. We're blatantly screwing them in the guise of providing secret knowledge. But all in all, these trader sites keep people inactive and inaction is our greatest ally. It's only when people stand up and act that our power is threatened. All they'd have to do is ask themselves which sites aren't promoting wing. Then they'd have a starting point to figure out who the plants are. And what do you expect in the future, an aged European man inquired. Nothing but more of the same, Rockefeller beamed. I mean, look at these people. I've been waiting for them to rise up and revolt for years now, but they just keep sitting around letting us crap on them. We raise their taxes and they do nothing. We allow their trade centers to get attacked, then lie about it afterwards, and they still do nothing. Now we plan on sending their children into war and they sit back and take it in a heartbeat with torches and guns ready to string us up by our feet. We keep manipulating them over and over and over again, but they don't react. Why? Come on, put up a fight, Rockefeller roared, swinging. And that's all war is anyway. One slave class killing another slave class for us, the elite class control and steal more money out of their paychecks. It really blows my mind how they can allow us to steal their money, especially when we don't pay any taxes at all. We figured out years ago how to get around that nonsense. Rockefeller took a deep breath and concluded, anyway, that's where we currently stand. We're still firmly in control and tap, tap, tapping on their keyboards and sending articles around then nothing will change and the status quo will prevail. But if they decide to truly organize and stop putting up with our lies, we'll be out of business before we know what hits us. Chapter 66, do we care enough to save America? 
I'm not going to address you by saying my fellow Americans or any of that other phony nonsense, nor will I speak to you in a calm, soothing voice as if you're eighth graders like Hillary Clinton and Al Gore do. They don't have any respect for you. In fact, they view the everyday man and woman with disdain. But I, will, I still believe in you. Also, things are so grave in the world today. I don't have time to mess around with such trivialities. Instead, I plan to lay out the truth in stark terms without any of the silly games other politicians play. So here goes. If we allow the controlling faction of international bankers, multinational corporate heads, and secret society members to continue their rule of America, the luxuries, rights, privileges that we currently enjoy will soon be gone. Take a look at what's happening in the world today. We're on the brink of World War III. We're already at war with Afghanistan. Then there's Saddam Hussein and the twisted butchers in Afghanistan. I mean, in Iraq and Iran, plus the Jews and Palestinians tearing each other's throats out. When America intervenes in these bloodbaths, North Korea will invade South Korea. Then India will invade Pakistan. Do you remember the Allied Axis division in World War II? George Bush has already thrown down the gauntlet, setting us against the axis of evil. Does the terminology sound eerily familiar? It should, because the same forces that manipulate and finance every war of the 20th century are the same ones setting the stage for World War III. Please listen. We need to either save this nation right now or surrender it. The people of the United States don't control their government. Worse, neither do our elected officials. Then who does? Sir. An evil oligarchy lurking in the shadows. These deceitful devils, the New World Order, have their sights set on bringing the American reign to an end. And to the forefront as the world's next exploited superpower. But this is what's happening. Don't listen to the lies on TV. They're weaving a masterful illusion. America is going to be brought to its knees. Think it can't happen? Neither did the Romans, the French, Genghis Khan, or the British Empire. But guess what? As arrogant and mighty as they all were, each was defeated and replaced by another. The British, one of the greatest dynasties of all time, never thought they'd be knocked from the top of the mountain. Or by us. Now we think the same way. America is the greatest economically, militarily, socially, and morally. And do you know what? Leave all these things too. But a sick, nefarious cabal of evil men is plotting our demise as we speak. How so? Basically, America is not equipped at this moment to fight a war on more than one front thanks to those who manipulated Bill Clinton. But with Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, and the Israeli-Palestinian debacle will be spread too thin. Then if India, Pakistan, and the Korea, Koreans flare up, all hell is going to break loose and we won't be strong enough to contain the situation. That's where China enters the picture. Did you know that the Red Army has as many soldiers in their military as we have people in our entire country? Think about how scary that is. Once we spread ourselves too thin in war after war, the Chinese are going to come in and wipe us away on the battlefield. Once that happens, the stock markets will collapse, financial havoc will ensue, and America will be thrust into a nightmare like none they've ever seen before. Look at the big picture. We are on the verge of disaster in this country and no one is doing anything to stop it. People who are aware of it, and I highly commend them, can only go so far. But let's be truthful. More books, magazines, articles, and videotapes aren't going to stop the juggernaut of destruction. Have they so far? No, and here's the reason why. 
The controllers, those people running the world, are evil, pure and simple. If you don't believe me, look at what's happening. 100,000 people die every day from starvation on this planet. 100,000. And guess what? have the money, resources, and technology to feed every one of them, but we don't. It's running the world. It seems to me that they're adults, but they sure don't behave like it. These people have wealth beyond comprehension, but they don't act to make our world better. Killing each other we're still killing each other like crazy with the United States now ready to invade Iraq. Haven't we learned anything? Can't those adults do any better than to let people starve or supply them with weapons so they keep killing each other? Yeah, think about it. Where are these wars being waged? Along the castle-lined rivers of affluence in Europe? Or the fancy mansion rows of Long Island or Washington, D.C.? Of course not. Poor people are waging the wars. Most of them don't have enough money to feed their families or build houses that we would even consider living in by American standards. Yet they have guns and rocket launchers to kill each other with. Where are these weapons and resources coming from? Do they suddenly appear? from the foreign aid that the controllers give them? How many years have we been giving them this supposed foreign aid to end starvation? At least four or five decades, yet 100,000 people die every day from hunger. How many billions of dollars have we spent around the world to create peace? But we still have over 30 wars going on with World War III possibly right around the corner. situation sound preposterous? Something's not right, and it isn't right because certain factions are guaranteeing that it's not made right. These factions are what we call the controllers, the New World Order, the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, Bilderbergs, and the Club of, Club of Rome, among others. These people want to create a one-world political, economic, and religious framework that will once and for all put an end to the sovereign existence we currently enjoy in America. The only way to stop these destructive forces is to expose them, then take over the system they currently monopolize. Their ultimate plan is to assume absolute control by turning chaos into order. This cabal controls all the banks and they control most governmental entities. Using these two vehicles with a compliant media to pave the way, the shadow powers will launch the next great war. The terrorist attacks on 9-11 were a symbolic beginning, and if you think that catastrophe was horrific, World War III will truly sicken you. This is going to be the real on a grand scale that mankind has never seen before. But to the controllers, war is a necessary step in their overall plan. Why? Because once we get so sick of the bloodshed and violence, when we can't tolerate even one more second of fighting, we'll finally lie down and accept their new world order. Can't you see? Conflict, and they're the ones in charge. They'll kill millions of innocent people. They already have in order to control. As I said, fear and chaos will be the main ingredients in the equation. Out of chaos, order. Some will say there is no such thing as the Illuminati or controllers. To them, history is nothing more than a series of random events. But don't believe them. Franklin Roosevelt said it best. In politics, nothing happens by accident. If it happens, you can bet it was planned that way. Folks, I implore you to listen. The greatness of this country is about to be taken from us. We're not as invincible as we once thought. Our fallen World Trade Center towers prove that. 
We are very vulnerable, very replaceable. Why? Because it's more economic potential than we do. Think about it. China is a virtually undeveloped market with over a billion residents, many of them without simple modern luxuries that we ignore like telephones and televisions. To the controllers who have seized world control primarily via financial means, China is the ultimate frontier, the final payoff. Look at the British Empire of old. They had the greatest military on earth, the greatest banks, and the most advanced political system ever known. They were literally king of the hill. But did their dynasty endure forever? No, we became the next superpower because in simplest terms, we held more. America was bigger. It could hold more people and it could be exploited economically a thousand times more than England. So we replaced them. Now look at China, limited land, a billion people, and 99% don't have a tenth of the appliances, gadgets, vehicles, and toys that we enjoy. They are very exploitable. Also, the labor is extremely cheap, and even better, the Chinese have never known freedom, ever. That means they won't be like us pesky Americans with our constitution, free speech, guns and bill of rights already a slave culture and always will be americans will soon be implanted with microchips to guarantee their docility but the chinese don't even need them they're already genetically wired for pacification with all this information in mind what are the leaders of our country doing everything in their power to stop chinese economic locomotive? Hell no. The controllers behind the scenes are using America, our great nation, to facilitate China's ultimate rise. We are the ones who are operating under trade agreements that benefit the Chinese while harming our domestic producers and manufacturers. Trade imbalance with them is so insulting it's a crime. In addition, we have given them most favored nation status. We are also giving them their computer hardware, technology, and know-how. The president visits them regularly to pave the way for even further. Technology so that they could further develop their atomic weapons. We are cows being led to slaughter, and we don't even know it. How are you going to like it when the next world leaders speak to you in Chinese? This is the bottom line. America is being destroyed by a hidden cabal of controllers who are intent on furthering their own agendas at our expense. Don't you get it? Using us as a means to an end. What does it take to get mad or enraged? We need to topple this It is a political and economic monopoly that's sick in its depravity, a thousand times worse than all the legions of organized crime. They've done. They've toppled the World Trade Center right before our eyes. They've assassinated presidents in broad daylight, created the atrocious AIDS virus, assumed total control of our media, stolen our vote via vote scam, and lie to us every step of the way. Wake up, they're killing us without conscience, undermining our way of life, and setting us up for a brutal downfall. Worse, they're doing it while we wave flags and rally around their war machine. Try to imagine life when we're no longer the world's ultimate superpower. Instead of the U.S. calling the shots, we'll be listening to and looking up at the Chinese communists as they parade around on center stage. We won't have, have as much money, a much lower standard of living, and we won't have nearly as much dignity. We will be reduced to followers instead of leaders, no longer masters of our own destiny. 
How will you enjoy being dominated by the United Nations and the Red Chinese? How much will you enjoy paying a world tax? How will you like no longer being able to speak freely? The Chinese people aren't blessed with freedom of speech at this moment. Do you think they'll let you embrace it once they assume control? Not a chance. Forget about it. They'll all be gone. As it stands now, the United States of America as a whole is eating steak while many other parts of the world for hamburger helper or worse. It's a great feeling to eat until we're filled. But how will you feel if you are the one eating slop while the United Nations and Chinese dish it out to you? The taste will be even more bitter if we knew we had a chance to alter the situation and didn't do anything to change it while for the time being. But if we refuse to act, if we settle into a state of complacency, everything we have on keeping what we have, I assure you, it will be gone to someone who owns a 50-room mansion. This person hires some servants and agrees to pay them a certain wage. He tells the workers what to do and they do it. But over time, the servants begin to take control of the mansion. When they see they can get away with it, they start giving themselves pay raises and hiring more and more workers to suck up an even greater portion of the homeowner's money. If that's not bad, the homeowner what to do. In other words, the servants are giving the owner orders, but you see, aren't really calling their own shots. Rather, some hidden outside agitators infiltrated their ranks, then took over the show. In the end, the homeowner loses complete control of his house while the servants run wild doing whatever they please as the outside infiltrators move on to take over a new property with an unwitting owner. Can you see the parallels to our own situation? We are the homeowners and the 50 room mansion represents the United States of America. The servants are our elected officials while the hidden agitators symbolize the controllers. Regrettably, this metaphor has come true in our country and the results are obvious. We've lost control own home, our nation, to a band of sinister manipulators who act in their own best interest, not ours. These servants have become so arrogant in their power, they're virtually unreachable. Don't believe me, try to get a face-to-face -face meeting with Congressman Hillary Clinton. It's virtually impossible to have her even respond to an email. Isn't it clear? The people on TV are lying to you, and they've been lying to you for eons. Dan Rather's job isn't to give you the nightly news. It's to give you a daily dose of con conditioning, not news. Likewise, our government leaders don't make any decisions they only implement those made by the ones who pull their strings. Why? Because the people who shots aren't located in Washington, D.C. The real power brokers sit in New York City skyscrapers and tell our selected officials in the nation's capital what to do. I'm sorry to say that is the brutal reality of our situation. At this point, elves. Is America worth fighting for? And I don't mean against some cave-dwelling psychopaths in Afghanistan. I mean for the true essential soul of our country, the America we've come to know and love. If you're not a citizen or a servant, what's the difference? A citizen takes responsibility for their rights and freedoms and fights to preserve them. A servant simply follows orders that are bestowed on them from above. The choice is clear. We'll fight to keep America first. Servants will lie down and allow themselves to be trampled over by the new world order. 
If you are willing to fight to save this great nation, what must you do? First, expose the lying, sick, evil, devil dog, new world order. Once everyone sees what their true motives are, it will be as much easier to overthrow them. And yes, I am talking about revolution. But don't get me wrong, I'm not referring to the overthrow of our American government. Only those secretive hidden controllers who have slithered their way into it. Of course, back, but don't allow yourself to be sucked into their deceit machine. You see, here's how they operate. It's all based upon the old notion of divide and conquer. To implement this technique, every bit of information given to us is based on five variables, race, gender, class, party, and religion. Look at your local newspaper or watch the nightly news. Almost every single story is intended to divide us, whether it's man versus woman, black versus white, Muslim versus Christian, gay versus straight, old versus young, rich versus poor. And the result is still the same. The longer we keep fighting against each other, the less time we'll have to focus our attention on the real enemy, the controllers. So don't fall for these tricks anymore. Instead, start calling your local newspaper or TV station. Don't just suggest that they start running stories on how destructive the New World Order and its controllers are. Don't let them off the hook. Call every day and tell them you refuse to be inundated and propaganda day in and day out. Then tell every one of your friends and relatives to do the same. It won't take long before they yeah. In the same vein, the media directly, whether you admit it or not, or whether you even know it or not, you're playing an increasingly vital role in implementing this new world order. But I'm going to level with you. You're being duped, either willingly or unwillingly. What's the solution? Don't take it any longer. Defy your editor, owners, and station heads. Run story truth, not just a slew of sanitized lies. I implore you, don't let controllers bamboozle you. You are responsible for the truth. Start giving it to us. The final step is to get someone into high elected office that has, hasn't already been bought, sold, and controlled by the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, or the Bilderbergs. It's our only hope. Thomas Jefferson once said there should be a revolution every generation to keep those in power honest. That revolution is long overdue. We need a true revolution, not one to overthrow the framework of our government, but one that will finally rid our political system of the slimy, sickening. America is worth fighting for. This is what we have to do. I don't know about you, but I'm throwing my hat in the ring and coming out swinging. Chapter 67, The Outlaw Class, America's Last Hope. I hear it all the time. Somebody should do something to change the way things are in this country. But the big question is, who's going to be the one to step forward and change things? Well, let's see. Is it going to be the controllers? Ruling class? Hell no. They're the ones responsible for putting the world in this predicament in the first place. They're the evil princes of the earth, the manipulators, the usurers, the death mongers, and the bloodsuckers. These are the sons of the ones who have the money, resources, and technology to feed every person in the world, yet allow 100,000 people to die of starvation every day. These are the psychotic Nazi eugenicists who created a god-awful AIDS virus to wipe out large segments of the population. 
These are the same controllers who steal our money through illegal taxation and interest-bearing loans to our government. They've devised a way to steal our voices at the ballot boxes via electronic vote scam and orchestrated a terrorist attack on our New York City skyscrapers to further fuel their sick, hungry war machine and to further implement more pervasive Big Brother tactics. When one looks around the world and sees a multitude of horrors, often the controller's invisible hand is behind the scenes pulling the strings. The ruling class are the manipulators, the provocateurs, a leisure class of bloodline-obsessed power freaks who conceal their motives, identity, and sources of hidden occult knowledge to further propagate their elitist status at the expense of all else, including the future of this planet and humankind itself. Do something about these sadistic control junkies. What? That's a good question. The most ability to affect serious change in the world, the enforcement class are so attached to vested interests that they refuse to do what's right because it might affect their vaunted position in life. What do I mean? Well, most every member of the enforcement class, the military, police, politicians, judges, lawyers, and media, among others, realize there are things seriously wrong with this country, but they still have it better than most. So why upset the apple cart? The crucial member is that of vested interests doing what most benefits oneself without considering the ramifications of a bigger picture. Viewed in these terms, you can understand why the CIA is the world's largest drug trafficker. It provides extra black budget money outside of congressional inspection. Why police forces in general don't want to completely eradicate crime, it would put them out of business. Why the military is pro-war, it's their livelihood. Or why politicians promote inherently flawed social programs. It keeps certain voters dependent upon them and perpetuates a system of conflict in which people must turn to them to solve their problems. The examination of vested interest is one of the most essential tools in understanding our world power system, for it goes hand in hand with On drugs is a perfect example of what a horrendous scam job is being pulled on us. Why? First of all, every drug agency in the world has a vested interest in addiction. Without it, they'd be on the streets looking for a new job. By the same token, with this scout scourge of fear, this guidance in this matter. When coupled with crime, terrorism, and inner city problems, we become as dependent upon government as on heroin. Finally, to solve this problem, our statesmen and media keep drumming up the fact, which is actually a fallacy, that they need more money to win this battle. And what does more funding imply? You guessed it, higher taxes. In all, the epitome of vested interest is played out in this simple war on drugs scenario. allows it to keep occurring on the streets at an acceptable level. The legal system prosecutes those who are unlucky enough to get busted. Thus, in the best interest of lawyers, judges, court officials, and prison employees, while the government machine keeps sucking out more money to feed itself. It isn't real hard to figure this stuff out. In fact, there is one entity that could very easily blow the lid off this entire shell game. And who would that be? The yellow-spined, pusillanimous, corporate-controlled American mass media. These folks aren't as sleazy as lawyers, as destructive as military men, as hypocritical as our religious leaders, or as corrupt as politicians, but they're still among the lowest and vilest of the lot because more than any other, they could take a stand to change our current situation. 
But they don't because they've sold their souls for a paycheck, job security, and a certain amount of phony status. These people are cowards who slavishly turn a blind eye to the deeds of drug traffickers, murderers, traitors, and sexual predators. And by doing so, their silence becomes equated with complicity. By serving as one of the controllers and forcers, they enable the crimes taking place in this country to continue. I would like to ask every journalist, reporter, news anchor, and writer one question. How can you look at yourself in the mirror when you keep doing the elite class's dirty work? Some of you say you're committed. Committed to what? Money, prestige, and security? Or the truth? Don't just stop at finding the truth or telling the truth. Expose it. Drop the smokescreen of propaganda and disinformation and give us the truth. It's your responsibility, so take it seriously. If the elite class and enforcers won't step forward to make life better for the whole of mankind, then who will? The middle everyday worker? I'm sorry, but overloaded with such a burden. They're simply not equipped for such an undertaking at least at this moment. But to their credit, if enlightened and enraged enough, these folks will be on our side. And once they start ripping and tearing, the controllers had better look out. There are a lot more of us than there are of them, and that scares the hell out of the ones at the top of the control pyramid. If no one else is willing or able to take the initiative to change our world, who else is left? The outlaws, our last for change. The outlaws, those who stand outside the conditioning process, those who refuse to bow and conform, those who can see beyond the veils, lies, and illusion. The outlaws, those who are sick and tired of the status quo, crimes, and corruption, those who are truly committed rather than allowing these creeps to keep dragging us down. In all honesty, take a look at the world the controllers have created. Has anything dramatically changed in the last 2,000 years? We still have people starving to death, murderers, rapists, greedy politicians, and an overall system that is corrupt to the core, which benefits the wealthy while enslaving those beneath them. Are you content being a dirty dog slave that the controllers use, manipulate, spit upon, and ultimately laugh at as fools? Do you like the sound of you with an overwhelming sense of life-affirming pride and joy? Do you prefer having a boot stomping on your face, or are you finally fed up with their crap? If you A rebel against the status quo, one who's ready to tear down the current system and eliminate completely those controllers who've turned our world into one on the brink of World War III. It's either that or shrug our shoulders and say, oh well, that's the way things have always been. As the elite globalists steal more of your money and throw salt in your open wounds and as you slave away another day. Or continuing any further, I suppose we should define exactly who comprises the outlaw class. The best explanation I've discovered to date was laid out by Professor X in Babel number 59. He begins by saying that the outlaws are given this pejorative term by the ruling enforcement and slave classes because they seriously threaten them. He continues, they're rarely mentioned, but if so, are excoriated in the severest terms by the media. They're gun nuts, white supremacists, fanatics, terms designed to evoke instantaneous and knee-jerk rebuke. One may wonder, why would all of the above classes be made to feel so uneasy by the outlaws? Professor X explains, the outlaws 
represent the most dangerous threat to the ruling class because if their ideas were allowed to proliferate, the slave class could possibly be awakened and there would be real danger that the system could turn against the ruling class. Dr. X tells us the outlaw class lives more or less in secrecy and very little is known about this class and very little is ever written or published about this class other than the illusions created once again by the media that is limited to printing the party line. But lo and behold, here it is, Babel Magazine, quite possibly one of the greatest ongoing documents that chronicle of activities and personalities associated with the outlaw class. We're not hiding, we're not concealing what we're doing, and we're certainly not suppressing our intentions and ideas. We're the ones on the fringe at the edge of the bell curve, those who aren't satisfied with being held down, stifled, silenced, or screwed over. The controllers would like nothing more than to eradicate our rebellious voices, but as Professor X once again explains, any attempt to stamp out members of the outlaw class calls attention to the fact that there even is an outlaw class. And this might distract some in the slave class from their primary allegiance, which is dedication to the objects of their indoctrination, the ruling class. Isn't it obvious? Who are you aligning yourself? Or those who seek freedom and truth? At the end of George Orwell's 1984, the people are so resigned, conditioned, and accepting of their overbearing tyranny, they come to love it. America is in dire straits, and if we want to change our situation and save this great nation, we're going to have to do it ourselves. The media won't help because they are a condition used by the controllers to keep us in line. The military is only interested in feeding their bloodthirsty war machine and the Democrats and Republicans are merely two heads of the same single-bodied serpent. The legal system gets its kick from laws and steel bars, of which are utilized to once again keep us in line, and secret societies conceal their knowledge to preserve, then expand their power base. In other words, none of these forces are ultimately on our side. So is everything hopeless? Um, so many entrenched institutions. Easy, for once in our lives, we need to join together instead of letting the controllers divide and conquer us. Rather than our usual battles, black versus white, men versus women, liberal versus conservative, rich versus poor, or Catholic versus Protestant, we need to ally ourselves with our only If we don't, I guarantee you that in one year, five years, or ten years, not only will things not be better for us, they'll be worse. And passing information from one computer to the next is not enough. It takes action, a revolution of information, economics, and outlook. We need to change and then run the controllers out of town, every town. It's now up to you and you and you and you are you willing to settle for the status quo or do you seek a better life for yourself your family and your nation we need action and we need a revolution chapter 68 an interview with victor thorne by jay conti of bankindex.com JC. Hello, Victor. It's a great pleasure to have you. Please tell us a little bit about yourself, about the books you have written and the driving force behind such controversial topics. Uh, VT. The driving force behind my political writing is fairly simple. I see this country being deliberately undermined by hidden forces that have seized control of our government by nefarious means and thus use it to further promote their globalist agenda. These shadowy figures 
labeled the controllers don't operate with our best interests in mind. Thus, the only hope we have left is to expose them in a dramatic way, then eradicate them as quickly as possible. JC, are passionate about your work and the message you're trying to convey to the public. Why is it important for the public to hear what you have to say? VT, in my opinion, the importance of what I write stems directly from survival and preservation. Do the American people enjoy being the world's premier superpower and all that this privilege entails? Do we appreciate our financial status and the freedoms we're essentially taking for granted? If we do, and this point is very serious, if we do cherish these ideals and rights, we better start acting like it because the die has been cast to alter the way of life we've become accustomed to. It's time that we look to see what the controllers are planning for us. And believe me, these devils are consummate planners. As of now, China is set to become the world's next superpower while America will assume a subordinate position, a la Russia, in relation to us right now. The reason that China will assume the reins of power isn't because they necessarily want to, but because they've been selected due to one elemental factor, exploitation. If viewed from a historical perspective, you'll see what I mean. Empire stood proudly as the world's preeminent superpower. No one else compared in terms of military or economic might. And if you would have asked my Englishmen if they'd ever get toppled from their throne, they would have thought the notion absurd. But lo and behold, entered the picture and those with global far-reaching aims realized the potential this land possessed. The American and industrial revolutions, our vast potential became apparent in terms of land, resources, and promise. Or, as Alphonse Rothschild said in 1849 while visiting New York City, without the slightest doubt, this is the cradle of a new civilization. So America boomed, bailed out Europe in a couple of world wars, and to become the greatest nation of modern times. But now China enters the picture with a population of 1 billion people, most of whom don't have cellular phones, microwaves, DVD players, or automobiles. So what do the controllers take? They select global to implement their plans by not only giving China most favored nation status, but they also sell them all the computer software, hardware, and know how to move them into our league. It's absurd, like cows deliberately walking into a slaughterhouse to be butchered. Thanks, Bill Clinton and George Bush one and two for selling us out. And that's only the tip of the iceberg. Don't even get me started on the atrocities of war, NAFTA, etc. JC, can you tell us about the American money system that is how it really works. I think an overview will benefit us all. VT. For any country to truly prosper, it must have control over its money system. It's that simple. Financial independence not being beholden to anybody is the key. By our founding fathers broke free from England. Not only did they seek religious freedom, but also financial freedom, or as historian Ralph Epperson noted, the cause of the revolution was the resistance of the colonies to the idea of borrowed money, resulting in debt and inflation, as well as interest payments, and not taxation without education, as is commonly believed. I'm afraid, though, that over two centuries later, we're as enslaved as a nation can be by outside forces that control the entirety of our purse strings. The money system controls America and those who call the shots are not located in Washington, DC, but in the financial centers of New York City and beyond, London, Paris, Germany, etc.
country pays approximately $360 billion a year in interest payments on the national debt. That's $360 billion every year. Imagine how much we could accomplish with that money if it wasn't funneled into the pockets of men who are already wealthy beyond words. From my perspective, this is the least common denominator to how our money system works. Usury is one of the greatest evils on this planet. JC. Now, about the Federal Reserve, it's no secret that you advocate the abolition of the Federal Reserve. But why? Tell us what makes this corporation so dangerous in your opinion. VT. The Federal Reserve Corporation, and remember that's what it is, a privately owned for-profit corporation is dangerous outside influences to usurp our government. Thomas Jefferson once said, I believe banking institutions are more dangerous than standing armies. Antony Sutton in the Federal Reserve Conspiracy added, nothing is more dangerous than understanding of the private control of the money supply, end quote. The dangers of this institution lie in the fact that it was created in 1913 on a premise of pure deception. Rather than being a part of the federal government, as its name implies, the Federal Reserve is actually closer to a central bank described by Karl Marx in the Communist Manifesto. Thus, the Federal Reserve System is an aggregate of private banks owned by international financiers who meet and make decisions behind closed doors. Since profits are an integral part of any business enterprise, what do you think the primary stockholders of the Federal Reserve, many of them foreign based, have as their highest priorities, our welfare or their own agenda? What's worse, money isn't even the predominant factor in their decision making process. They already have fortunes beyond their wildest dreams. It was even estimated that in 1900, the Rothschild family owned half the world's total wealth. No, what's really frightening is that power and control are their main motivations. And in that sense, we have to ask ourselves, does someone like David Rockefeller or his ilk sitting in skyscrapers overlooking New York City have the same priorities as we do? The answer is no, they don't. That's where the danger lies. JC, do you know who the actual owners of the Federal Reserve are? Can you tell us how the ownership of the Federal Reserve is split? VT, in Economic Solutions, Peter Kershaw provided a list of the 10 primary shareholders in the Federal Reserve banking system. Child family, London. Two, the Child family, Berlin. Three, the Lazard brothers, Paris. Four, Israel Saif, Italy. Five, Loeb, Germany. Six, the Warburgs, Amsterdam. Seven, the Warburgs, Hamburg. Eight, Lehman Brothers, New York City. 9. Goldman and Sachs, New York City. 10. The Rockefeller Family, New York City. What's truly appalling is that 7 of the top 10 stockholders in the Federal Reserve are located in foreign countries. Jim Mars adds in his excellent book, Rule by Secrecy, that the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which undeniably controls the 11 other Federal Reserve branches, is essentially controlled by two financial institutions. A. Chase Manhattan, a Rockefeller stronghold with 6,389,445 shares or 32.3%, and B. Citibank with 4,051,851 shares or 20.5%. Thus, these two entities control nearly 53% of the New York Federal Reserve Bank. The power they have is 
national debt, how does it work? And ultimately, who is all the money owed to? Arn. The national debt at this time is approximately $5.9 trillion. Of that, $2.54 trillion is owed to international bankers, or 37%. The other $3.38 trillion is owed to the public. The interest we pay each year is approximately $360 billion. My solution to this colossal problem is as such. A. Default on that portion of the national debt not owed to private American citizens. How can we do such a thing? Well, if a person defaults on their car or mortgage, what happens? The automobile or house gets repossessed. But what are the international bankers going to do? Repossess our country? Hardly. We simply tell them point blank that we refuse to pay them any more interest or the principal. It may mean going to war, but it's time to show the world that these bankers are the real terrorists. B. We make a one payment to all public holders of our national debt. C. We finally return the creation of money back to Congress as is written in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Subsection 5. Only Congress has the right to coin money and regulate their value thereof. A side note, our national debt rose in just 30 years from $409 billion in 1971 to $5.9 trillion in 2002. That means when Nixon was president, we only owed one-fifteenth of what we owe today. C. How does the Federal Reserve operate? If at all, can you estimate their profit margin? Victor Thorne. This is the trickiest question of all, and I must admit that there are e economic scholars who could discuss the nuts and bolts details better than I, but I'll give a brief overview to the best of my ability. The Treasury Department prints money for the Federal Reserve, then in turn lends it to our government at interest. Here's where the scam enters the picture. According to David Interrupt America, it costs $23 to print $1,100 bills. If you printed 10,000 of these bills, it would naturally cost $230 or 23 cents times 10,000. But here's the catch. Bills would equal $1 million. So the cost of creating a million dollars is only $230. Financial industry call this practice seniorage, but to me it's closer to outright theft. In fact, I view the Federal Reserve in the same light as I do organized crime. This privately owned corporation creates money for practically nothing, then lends it to us with interest. Then to cover its debt, government imposes taxes on its citizens. The higher the debt, the more interest we owe, and thus the higher taxes become. It's a vicious cycle, and guess who ultimately wins? The controllers. JC, do you think this is why, as Americans, we will never be able to finish paying what we owe? Fan of the Republicans, Democrats, Independents, Greens, or Libertarians, so please don't think I'm bashing. I dislike all of them equally. Anyway, George Bush's 2002 federal budget came to approximately $2.5 trillion. And if you stack this amount of money in $1 bills, it would reach all the way to the moon and halfway back again. The national debt is three times larger, so these stacked dollar bills would stretch from the earth to the moon and back, then from earth to the moon and back again, then halfway to the moon. Yet the interest, let alone the principal, our war machine set to roll at top speed again, the debt will only get worse. JC, 
It has been said that the same people that own the Federal Reserve, own the media, the big oil companies, and even have powerful ties to the government of the United States and those of other countries. If so, how does this affect the dynamics of a true democracy? VT, you are pyramid of control in the world with the international bankers at the top of it, secret society, European aristocracy, royalty below them, followed by the heads of international companies and old money American families at the third level with, get this, certain political leaders at the fourth tier. It is my assertion that these political leaders, George Bush, Bill Clinton, Ted Kennedy, etc., parents elected but selected by groups such as the Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, and the Bilderbergs. If Americans ever peered behind the veil and saw the Wizard of Oz illusion that controls their political system, they'd be shocked beyond belief. In regard to the dynamics of a democracy, again, I would say it is nothing but illusion. Once we examine vote scam, black budget enterprises, membership to certain globalist groups, and how the true political power base isn't located in Washington, D.C., but in New York City, we'd realize that our say-so and how this country is run is extremely limited. Jace, do we even live in a real democracy? The internet is festering with material showing that we are living an illusion, that our leaders are fronting for the elite, and reports T. The best answer to this question can be found in the Bilderberg meeting the 30th to June 2nd, 2002, at the Westfields Marriott in Chantilly, Virginia, only seven miles south of Washington, D.C. 120 of the world's most powerful bankers, statesmen, politicians, CEOs, royalty, and media members met on the outskirts of our nation's capital. Now, when the world's greatest actors meet every year at the Academy Awards, does the media cover the event? Of course. When our two best football teams meet at the Super Bowl, is the media there? Naturally, the Grammys, the media is there. The Emmys, media there. Paul McCartney's wedding, media there. The president's inauguration, the media is there. Hell, the media even covers frog jumping contests in rural Mississippi. But when the Bilderbergs or Trilateral Commission meet to discuss such topics as our impending war with Iraq, a UN-sanctioned world tax, terrorism, and America's dollar becoming the common currency of North, South, and Central America, not one media source except the American Free Pet Press covered this vitally important event. I contacted the national editor at the Washington Bureau of the Knight Rider newspaper chain, the executive editor of our local newspaper, and a nationally syndicated radio talk show host, Mike Gallagher, urging them to cover this conference, while scores of other people notified the major TV networks, CNN, and high-profile newspapers and magazines, such as Time and the Washington Post, who even have a representative present at the meeting but none of them covered the event. Why? Because the same people who control the president, Congress, banks, and major corporations also own the media. Essentially, five major corporations own the entire mainstream media in this country. Of course, government misconduct is rampant in America, such as illegal chemtrail spraying by the military and the UN but the biggest crime facing us is that our government has been usurped and the media refuses to expose the power structure that exists behind the scenes. To them, Bush or Bill Clinton, but nothing could be further from the truth. These individuals are nothing more than implementers or of decisions made by the shadow government. 
If the media ever let this cat out of the bag, our world would be dramatically different. So the secret is guarded with obsessive care. JC, any relationship between the elite and 9-11? If so, can you explain? Where do I start on this one? I guess the best place to begin is with the preponderance of evidence pointing out in glaring detail that those in positions of power were aware that an attack was going to occur on the morning of September 11, 2001. And I'm not talking about vague generalities, but precise times, dates, where's, when's, and how's. Obviously, due to space and time limitations, I won't delve into specifics. But if anyone gets on the internet and starts researching this subject, they'd be blown away by how much so many people knew. The underground press, alternative news sources, and online websites have been writing about 9-11 foreknowledge since late 2001. And finally, Congress has convened to look into this matter. The only problem is, I examined a list of members from both investigative committees and guess who is manning them? Almost every person is a member of the Trilateral Commission, the CFR, Bilderberg, or has received huge campaign contributions from the Carlyle Group or defense contractors. Similar to the Roberts Commission investigating FDR's foreknowledge of Pearl Harbor and the Warren Commission looking into JFK's assassination, both of which naturally were shams, these current sessions will be nothing more than window dressing. Now you may wonder, why would the controllers allow hijacked jets to plummet into the World Trade Center and Pentagon? The answer is simple. Similar to the sinking of the Lusitania, Pearl Harbor and the Gulf of Tonkin, Americans need a dramatic event to raise their ire and pull them into war. That's what 9-11 accomplished. We were rocked to our very core. The result was also quite evident. The controller's motives are so easy to see once you know what to look for. Anyway, sites on Afghanistan and getting the war machine rolling, the elite are capitalizing on the three biggest industries or money-making ventures in the entire world, usury, energy, and drugs. Controllers make vast amounts of money off of war because every country involved needs money to finance their efforts. So where do they get their capital? From the international bankers. And what results from loans? Interest, lots and lots of interest. Once each nation gets their money for the war machine, they need to buy bombs, guns, tanks, bullets, planes, etc. And where do they get these necessities? At the local Walmart? No, nope, they have to buy them from the major defense contractors that are owned by whom? Yep, the controllers. In this country, if you investigate the Carlisle Group, you'll see how it fits part and parcel into our war efforts. Two, energy. There are huge deposits of oil in the Caspian region of Russia, and we have a plethora of pipelines already in place in the Middle East. The energy companies find immeasurable benefits in getting this oil to the pipelines. The only problem is little country sitting between them, Afghanistan. Three, the CIA is the largest drug dealer in the world and has been involved in drug trafficking since its inception 50 years ago, and even before then as the OSS. All of their black budget projects are financed by drug dealing, along with money laundering, illegal arms sales, and gambling, etc. Afghanistan is the world's leading producer of opium, 75% of the total. And a few years ago, the Taliban stopped all production. Now, if the CIA is deriving huge amounts of money from heroin and opium and morphine, then this source suddenly dries up, there's a problem. 
Well, I've just read that since the Taliban have essentially been eradicated from Afghanistan, guess what's back in full production again? You guessed it, the poppy fields. We need to remember that by and large, wars don't start with the masses. They're incited by the controllers to create a condition. As Abraham Lincoln's Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton said, and that's exactly what's happening right now. A new world order is being created and we're simply bit players in this theater of war. JC. So how? BT. The aim for centuries has been the establishment of an occult based new world order where national boundaries will all but be eliminated. There will still be certain regions such as the Americas, but the world will more closely resemble modern day Europe with a common currency and unified states. The United Nations or a similar organization will replace individual governments and there will be global concepts introduced such as a world tax, world court, world anthem and world army. Specifically in regard to America, there is a battle being waged between the globalist and nationalist or populist, those who want America to retain its sovereignty and not fall under the rule of a global hierarchy. Incredibly, most of the national players you see on TV fall under the globalist category. Another concept that must be considered is the United States deliberately being undermined by its leaders who are in and GATT and giving our technological and computer know-how to China. We're chopping ourselves off at the which we built the greatest nation of all time is being eliminated at a frightening pace. Also, when you see how is being dispatched, thinned out across the globe in preparation for World War III, you'll understand how vulnerable our position is. Keep your eye on China. Let's say you had access to the floor of Congress for 10 to 15 minutes and that all members were present. What would you say to them? I don't think it would much matter what I had to say to Congress. Why? Except for a few rebels, congressional members are in a position where they're more than satisfied with the status quo. Here's my rationale. First of all, years ago, George Wallace said, there's not a dime's worth of difference between the Republicans and the Democrats. And it's true. Oh, sure, it appears as if there is, but it entire media political scene is nothing more than professional wrestling. How can I make such a Well, both have predetermined outcomes that are established out of public view and both present the results in a dramatic fashion. It's all illusion, folks. JC. Say to the American people. VT. Pure and simple, if you want to preserve the rights and freedoms that you've become accustomed to, and if you'd like to see America remain the hill, then immediate decisive action must be taken. I'm talking about a revolution to overthrow the controllers that have illegally taken possession of our government. Now don't jump to conclusions or get me wrong. I'm not saying that we should overthrow the government. First of all, it's against to make such a statement and secondly there's nothing inherently wrong with our government in theory as it was envisioned by our founding fathers problems arose when the international bankers both foreign and domestic seized control of our money supply that's who we need to eliminate if we don't i promise you that our quality quality of life will dramatically decrease in the coming years but how do we get rid of these devils Here's a partial answer. A, the Federal Reserve System. B, default on that national debt owed to international bankers. C, 
return the creation of money to Congress as it was prior to 1913. D, abolish duties. E, impose tariffs on every product imported into this country. Do we have the guts and courage to save this nation or are we going to roll over and play dead? The controllers have committed so many crimes and atrocities against the American people, it's time to retaliate. There's an individual named Rick Stanley who's running for a congressional seat in Colorado that's organizing a million gun march in Washington, D.C. next July 3. Such an idea is precisely what we need to assemble a large numbers with guns in hand, or if you don't like guns, then take a shovel, broom, torch, or whatever else would have an impact and show the controllers that we're not going to allow them to hold us hostage any longer. It's now or never, if we don't get organized and take back our country, it's all over. It's up to you to decide if America is worth saving or if we're gonna let the controllers steamroll over us. I'm ready and willing to do my part. Chapter 69, Afterward, He Who Would Face the Winds by Lisa Giuliani. Cautious, careful, always casting about to preserve their reputation and social standing never can bring about a reform. Those who are really in earnest must be willing to do be anything or nothing in the world's estimation and publicly and privately in season and out avow their sympathy with despised and persecuted ideas and their advocates and bear the consequences. Susan B. Anthony an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is in reality expressing the highest respect for the law. Martin Luther King Jr. The average man does not want to be free. He simply wants to be safe. H. L. Mencken in my city, everyone's talking about college football these days. Soon, the hot topic will be our upcoming holiday season. Like so many Americans across the nation, the community of State College, Pennsylvania, appears to be sleepwalking right through the passage of both the Patriot Act and the newly enacted Homeland Security legislation. The people of this bustling seem unaware of these events and continue about their lives with a business as usual mentality. Out on the street, in restaurants and in bars, no one is talking politics. Everyone seems completely insulated from what is taking place in their own country. The world directly in front of their eyes is the only one they see and the only one in which they live. Citizens across the country suffer from a similar affliction. Maybe that is why the voices of the people of America are not being heard. Most of the people aren't talking about things that matter. As I walk along the streets of this city, snippets of conversation drift by, and it boggles my mind, all minority, that even realizes just how fragile is the thread that connects us to our freedom. I want to characterize it as ignorance, but it's more than that. It's disinterest. I would be lying if I said that people seem to be worried about what's happening to their own country, so I won't lie. America, I'm trying to reach you. Can you hear me? I'm feeling for some faint pulse that tells me you're alive, and I'm having trouble finding it. Tell me. How can you remain oblivious to the destruction of your way of life, of the erosion of your liberty, while you sit in your little worlds wrapped up in your personal agendas, focused on college football and other really important stuff? Your government is insidiously erasing what's left of your sovereignty, your privacy, your right to self-govern, you, and they're doing 
it before your eyes. What do you say, America? Many of you lie sleeping at night, insulated from and blind to the reality that is all but smacking you in the face. There are others out there like me who lie in our beds at night, restless with misgivings, wide awake and wondering as to what the dawn will bring. More than perceptible, the chasm so wide I doubt it can ever be bridged. To initiate discussion among those who remain unaware or apathetic to the current state of the union is to the path of those who mock what they fail to understand. Let's just say that I raise more than a few eyebrows when I talk to people around here. I know how our ancestors must have felt at the time of the American Revolution. I can feel their presence around me like a whisper of conscience. They stand at the shoulder of every patriot with the flags and stickers all over their vehicles. I'm talking about the real patriots like those who drove to Washington, D.C. for Freedom Drive 2000. Their voices are the voices of justice. Their words ring with life, with passion, with principle. Like our predecessors, the real patriots are people of courage and conviction. If they know fear, and I believe they do, they don't let it defeat them or dictate their actions. The true patriot stands to face the winds rather than bowing to them. Our ancestors knew that in order to defeat the enemy, they would have to stand together and rise above their fear. This they did of America ever got off the ground in the first place. Open your eyes, people. There's more to life than football and Christmas parties. I hate to bring this up, but those presents you're saving things that will cost you. I am reminded of the Korean War Memorial, which summed it up perfectly. Freedom is not free. The bell is not mere ringing, the bell is tolling. If you can't hear it by now, maybe you're not just, you're sleeping, maybe you're dead. <laughs> if Paul Revere ride through the streets of my city on one of these very dark nights and sound the warning to every man, woman, and child throughout, who would hear him? Would you, Joe Q. Citizen, would you rise from your slumber and take up your arms? Would you even roll over in your bed? God, I hope so. Do you know that those liberties you possessed just yesterday may not apply to you today? Which of your freedoms will you kiss goodbye tomorrow? Can you hear me? Erica, shake off the cobwebs that have gathered in your brain and sniff the revolution in the air. It's not something you're familiar with because life has been easier for you than it was for those who came before you. But it is there nonetheless. Regardless of how much your ranking in the world's estimation might matter to you, believe me when I tell you that it matters not. Besides, you will rank lower if you sit back and let your country die without at least trying to save her. Come and gone before you, those brave souls who fought and gave their lives to save her will have died for nothing. They died for you and me. Remember that. The patriots of the coming revolution are standing in the midst of this madness. On the horizon looms more of the atrocity we've seen in recent times, only far worse and more all-encompassing. By virtue of magnitude, it will dissolve any feelings of disconnection the majority of unsuspecting folks currently feel at the present time. We are in for another jolt by the powers that be. Will you arise when that jolt shakes you from your slumber, America? Will that far-reaching catastrophe get your heart pumping again? Last night I spoke with Rick Stanley on the Victor Thorne show, and he said, America is ruined. I'm not sure how many people listened to what this man had to say, but his words were full of fire and they deeply troubled me. See, on the inside, I keep a flicker of hope burning for America to survive. 
There are others out there scattered here and there who also carry this flame. These people bear proudly the tattered vestiges of what's left of our heritage. They also they are, are the scorned and reviled, the dissidents and radicals. We also know them as patriots, seldom acknowledged for what they do. They still stand at the ready for the worst, which is inevitably yet to come. I don't know if America is ruined, but she sure is fading fast. Her light is dimmed and her breath shallow. How long will she last at this rate? We are but a blink away from losing her forever, and once she is gone, we will not be able to breathe the life back into her. Are you ready to face that day? I'm not. My hope still lives, regardless of how the rest of the world or my countrymen see me. I will hear the rallying cry of revolution when it comes, and I'm feet and ready for the chips to fall where they may. What about you, America? When the winds shift, will you stand and face them with courage or simply sit and let them blow you off this map? Generation, ours, has the chance to bend history. If we don't embrace this one opportunity we now have, then we willingly and recklessly forfeit those freedoms given to us so long ago by men of great courage and conscience. Does this generation possess that kind of strength of character? It makes me wonder, America, can you hear me? You really need to wake up now. Tomorrow may be too late.